Hello and welcome to M&A Murders and Accusations, the good, the bad, and the ugly of selling your business. We dig into what you need to know and how not to kill the sell of your business. Now here's our host, Rick J. Krebs, Mergers and Acquisitions Advisor. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show today. This is Rick J. Krebs, m and Cowboy, talking about murders and accusations. Don't kill your deal. So today, we are talking about seven things that can totally kill your deal. I can send you a death certificate for every one of them. I've seen, uh, things, I've seen these things happen. I've seen them impact transactions. So I want to make sure that you're aware. First is poor record keeping. If you have financials that are not up to snuff, get you a good CPA and get your financials in order. Get your records there. If you don't have good records, it puts you in a weaker bargaining position with your buyer, plain and simple. You just don't know. And oftentimes a weaker value. Um, so get your books up to order, up to snuff. Get them where they should be. Next thing is selling when your revenues are plummeting, when they're going down. Don't sell when you do that because you can sell. I've sold those companies. However, you're going to get less of a selling price. Simple as that. In the business, we call it catching the falling knife. And that means people don't want to catch the falling knife. Why? Because you catch your hand, right? You don't want to catch the falling knife and buyers don't want to either. So sell on the upswing. Number three, failure to maintain confidentiality. So Anytime you have a, a buyer that comes to you, an unsolicited offer, a buyer approaches you, don't give them anything. Make them sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, confidentiality agreement. If you need one, hop on my website, shoot me an email. I'll send you one you can use. But you absolutely want to make sure you lock people in and you don't breach that confidentiality. Employees can find out. I heard about a transaction one time that, that one of the employees found out and they put up on the poster board in the lunchroom. But um, that the company was for sale. Immediately, everyone knew. It just blew up on him. They had to do damage control. That's the last thing you want to do. Next thing, mentally checking out of your business. If the gas is blinking on your tank, you've got to get that thing sold before you mentally check out of the business. When you check out, the employees check out, you just see that business start to plummet. So you got to get it to market and sold before that happens. you got to plan that exit and you got to you know, get there. We can sell them, but you just don't get optimal selling price. It's like the vultures are circling the buyer vultures and they, they smell blood and then they're coming at you with lower prices and you end up selling for lower than you really should. Um, making big purchases without consulting your advisor. That's number five. So I tell all of my business sellers, run your business like you're never going to sell it. And that's hard to do. Easy to say, run it like you're never going to sell it. You know, you get an LOI, you're about ready to close and you see, you know, you see those dollar signs, you don't have half of them spent, but know that transactions can unwind at any time. I saw one unwind after the seller had misrepresented a bunch of stuff and lied and the buyer's like, you're going to unwind this thing or I'm going to send you to jail and he unwound it. So you've got to. Make sure that you run it like you're never going to sell it up through the closing date. The reason I say that is you've got to make big purchases. If you're, if you're forced to make a big purchase through the selling price, talk to your M&A advisor before that or your broker. Make sure you plan that. If it's after an LOI, you got to talk to the buyer. If it's after an LOI, oftentimes that you can add it to the purchase price and get the buyer to pay for it. But if you don't talk to them, you're a little bit SOL. And uh, you know what, SOL, it's all right, out of luck. You don't want to be there. Look, or you make big equipment purchases, talk to somebody, talk to your broker, talk to an advisor to make sure that he can get you that money for them um, before you already spend it. Okay, number six, don't list too high of a selling price. We see this a lot. We see a lot of business owners out there, not a lot, but a fair amount of brokers that are just slapping crap up against the wall, hoping it will stick. You know, asking a business owner, what do you think your business is worth? Oh, 10 million bucks. Okay, that's what we're asking for. You know, they don't do a formal valuation. They don't take the time to look at what it truly should sell for. They just throw it out there high, hoping it will stick. So don't do that because it makes the other businesses that ever sell look better. 
than yours, the last thing you want to do is make everyone else look better than you do. So price it reasonably, get it out there, get it sold. Number seven, failure to hire the right brokers or M&A people or advisors or attorneys or CPAs. Your attorney or CPA can kill your deal faster than you can blink an eye. And sometimes it's well-intentioned people that do it. In fact, oftentimes it's well-intentioned people that do it, but they're better at killing them than they are at keeping them alive. They don't know how to do CPR in a transaction. They don't know how much work goes into it. They're just telling clients, making them afraid. And so you've got to get the right people out there on your on your team. And when I say right people, how do you know that they're the right people? How do you know your attorney's the right person? Simple question. When you're shopping for an attorney, you ask them, how many transactions have you done of this size in the last year? If they haven't done at least two, go find someone else. A lot of people say they do M&A work or business selling work, and how they do it is they learn from your transaction. They just learn from that, and that's how they do it. We were involved in a, in a sale a few years back, and the attorney was picked by my seller, and it was a good high school buddy of his, and, and we're sitting in the negotiations, and we got to a sticky point, right? The buyers wanted something, we wanted something. The attorneys were back and forth, kind of locked up like two old bulls in the pasture. Their horns were locked. And I said, hold on just a minute. We put it on pause and I asked the attorney, I said, you know what? This isn't rocket science here. This should be normal. There should be some wording in one of your past contracts. It's just normal. Stick it in. Let's get over this and get this thing done. The attorney looked at me and said, Rick, and I kid you not, Rick, I'm a divorce attorney. This is the first business sale I've ever done. I could have died. I was like, what? No way. We're three quarters of the way through. And and the buyer's attorney had a whole bunch of problems with our attorney. And they were telling me about it, bending my ear all day. I'm like, now I know. They didn't know how things were done. And ironically, that attorney was only like $300 an hour. The other attorney we were dealing with was Beverly Hills attorney. He was a thousand bucks an hour. And my buyers, I, I would swear on it, they paid less in attorney fees than we paid because they had a deal guy that knew what he was doing. He charged a lot per hour, but he knew what he was doing. He got the thing done. So get the right people on your team. Make sure they're deal guys. Make sure that they know what they're doing. And if you're going to win the Super Bowl, you got to have good players. you got to have good players on your team. So those are seven things that can kill your transaction. And now you know, so you don't murder your deal. And I am so happy today to have Peter Christman with me on the show. A um, little background about Peter. So I had heard about Peter for many months before I got the opportunity to meet you. I don't know if you know that. No, no, no. <laughs> You're a legend. You, you must have been in the post office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, side by side. <laughs> Most wanted. <laughs> so I'd heard about Peter. He's a legend in the M&A exit planning space. And the reason I say is a legend is back in the early 90s, he wrote this little book. Uh, what was the, what was the year, 92, 93? But, well, the, no, it was in that, a little bit later than that. And uh, I, uh, uh, that, that book is uh, the, the, the basis of my whole exit planning model right there in that book, you know. So in the 90s, Peter started talking about exit planning before anyone was talking about exit planning. He's, I want to say, the founder of the notion of exit planning. People were just transactional back then. All they wanted to do is just close a transaction and move on. But Peter brought up the idea of exit planning and the need to plan for an exit. So he wrote this book. So what was it that precipitated the the writing of this book? Well, I... I the, the book was created for several reasons. One is uh, I, I wanted to, uh, one of the biggest things in exit planning were, I, I've never liked the term exit, and that's why I put master planning on that book. Because uh, exit, exit planning, the exit, it, you run into a lot of issues from a confidentiality point of view. Business owners are a little goosey about that uh, subject and so forth. So I thought master planning uh, uh, was really a term I wanted to use. But the problem was the industry was using that term. So I, I said, okay, I will use the term uh, exit planning. And uh, uh, 
to answer your question, this book is designed. The main design is 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 the, to educate the business owner on what this whole thing is about of exit planning or or master planning. The second purpose of this book is that so advisors could use something to be productive in their prospecting for clients that they would like to obtain and to put them through the exit planning process. So what I recommend to, to and, and what's been very effective, productive, is uh, that business uh, advisor would have a prospect, would give the prospect this book, hey, uh, I'd like to have you, uh, Rick, I'd like to have you read this book on but I ran into, I read it myself, but I, I thought it was really informative. And you know what? What's even better, I think you're going to find it even more informative than I did. So as you can see from the book, it's not very big. Not, it's not going to be very big. And it's got larger font because us older people, you know, like larger font. <laughs> so, uh, Rick, uh, take a look at that. What if I gave you this book then? Um, and you read it, and what I'd like to do is get back together again after you had read it. Mm-hmm. So uh, today is uh, Tuesday, well, about uh, uh, maybe 10 o'clock next Tuesday. How's your schedule looking for then? Great prospecting tools. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you, you, you've already confirmed that you're going to meet with me next Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Okay. So anyhow, that's how an advisor can use the book in prospecting. Now, what happens? You get together with uh, your your prospect uh, and in a week or two or whatever time they, they've given you, and now you've got a plethora of information with which to start your discovery process, and you just sit back and boom, boom, just fire questions, and then and the other thing is you've got to shut up I sit with so many advisors that ask questions and they don't shut up. And I'm telling you, if listening is one of the greatest skills that you can have in this profession. And the more you listen, the smarter you get uh, with that client. I love it. So uh, take away. The more you listen, the smarter you get. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I love it. Uh, so anyhow, that you you uh, asked about the book. I gave you a long answer to your question about the book, but uh, uh, those are some of the reasons why uh, I I wrote it. This segment is on the seven deadly things that can kill your business sale. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show, the podcast, M&A, Murders and Accusation, brought to you by the Heber City M&A Cowboy, Rick J. Krebs, and thank you for joining us today. I am pleased to announce my guest, uh, Peter Christman, a legend in the space of exit planning and selling businesses the business for many, many years. He's probably forgotten more than I know, (laughs) but I'm so glad to have Peter here today. I have forgotten. You're right. (laughs) (laughs) And as you can tell, just a great man. Um, We're talking about the seven deadly sins that, or I call them seven deadly things that can kill your business sale. And I'd like to, I'd like to have you share with us, Peter, what are some things that can kill a sale? You have a lot of experience selling companies and doing exit planning. What have you seen that that could kill the sale? Yeah, there's so many things that could kill the sale. Uh, I th- I think starting out, uh, the, one of the one of the biggest things is that if the owner doesn't know, the owner doesn't know and can't picture himself in a new light after they exit their their business and mm. sell their business, uh, it ain't gonna happen. I, my experience has shown that that you got to remember that this is their baby. Uh, this is the thing they get up every morning for, show up for. They're they're the they're the, uh, 
they have a certain um, position in society mm -hmm. from the business and so forth. And uh, it's a, it's going to be a new life. And they've got a picture of themselves in that new life. And if they can't, uh, I don't care how uh, much your offers are and so forth, they, they're not going to move. And I honestly think that that's, that, that is one of the biggest things uh, of what kills a, a, a deal. Wow. If they got to they gotta picture themselves in that new life and, and so forth. So, and I could talk about how you get there, but I, I'll go on because you asked for seven. <laughs> uh, so hold on one second. Before we go to the next one, I found that as well. If the seller isn't motivated to sell, you know, selling a company is a is a bit of a bumpy road, and there are going to be roadblocks. There are going to be um, issues. You know, I'm selling a company right now, and we had an issue pop up, and and uh, we joke in the business that the deal has to unwind three times before it closes. Right? And there's all kinds of yeah, all kinds of things. We can't even begin to tell you what pops up. You know, um, just things as part of the transaction. But if the seller's not motivated to work through those issues. And to work through those those concerns that a buyer might have, or whatever it may be, then the deal's not going to close. I love that one. Thank you. And and I would say on the other side of that, you have to have a motivated buyer. These buyers have to be willing to go. And and the ones that have closed that I've seen that we work on, you have a motivated seller and a motivated buyer, and then it can happen. But if they're not that motivated, they're just kind of toe dipping, right? Versus diving in, then they don't have the the um, driving the initiative to to work through these problems or work through an issue or a concern to get the deal done. Love that one. Okay, go ahead. And, well, I, I tell you what, the, the, the seller, the business owner, cannot tow dip because the risk of getting involved in the sales campaign and and not dip, uh, dipping your toe, as you say, the, the risks are too great. One, the risk of confidentiality, the risk of getting out into the marketplace that the company's for sale, uh, the risk of employees uh, knowing that the business is for sale. The process is just way too important to toad it. You can't do it. And if you're not committed, I don't want to do business with you. And you shouldn't do business with me or anybody else. <laughs> that's okay? right. You know, that's right. And be fully committed to the task because it, it, if not, if if not, if it's not done the right way, you're going to decrease the value of what you have. We don't want to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. If we want to do the opposite, increase the value of what you have. And, you know, so sell it like you mean it. That's my take. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Anything sell it, sell it like you mean it. Exactly. There's so many, uh, there's so many uh, issues that you you discover uh, on your uh, what one of the hardest things you have to do is when the business owner is the business. In other words, if uh, if what would happen in that business if that business owner left. And that's one of the things that buyers are looking for as to what effect the answer to that question would have for the deal. And I think that you, that's part of the whole, again, I'm talking about issues, but then those issues have to be addressed. And, and the discovery process, which is your first step in, in any step, is so important. Because you have got to, and I, I tell, tell you, Lawrence, we did, when we developed their confidential business review, we've got to be entirely honest with what's going on. There's no, no PS is right. <laughs> and you've got, you got to talk about the good and you've got to talk about the bad and the ugly. Because I tell you what, that book is going to be the whole blueprint for due diligence and documentation later on in sale, okay? The other thing you've got to make sure your your client is really telling the truth. Is I tell you what, they're not good at BS, and they can't remember 
their BS. So you got to make sure that they're being honest with themselves, with the with the buyer during the buyer showings and so forth. And and uh, uh, you know these buyers are very sophisticated, as you well know, a hell of a lot more sophisticated in the process than the than the client is. They're more experienced, right? right? Exactly, more experienced at it. Yeah. And at, at client, uh, one of the things we do is in educating the client on what they're going to go through in this whole process. They're going to be dealing with some very smart people who recognize BS. Okay. And uh, so, want to be perfectly honest with them. And one of the things, other things, uh, we're we're selling is the future of that business with a new person or company in charge of it, driving it, and then show them how they can take this business and do certain things and be more productive and what the business is right now. I like the way you're talking about there with them, with the sellers being less experienced in the transaction and the buyers being very experienced with transactions. I, uh, as a little kid, we played T-ball. Many of them, yeah, softball yeah. or baseball, right? I was, I was playing before T-ball. <laughs> <laughs> but I did play baseball in college. So, I, so when you, I remember we were in a little league team and uh, we had this one guy named Quinn, and he was one of those guys. I think we were about ready to meet puberty, you know, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. And there's always that kid that, that's 12, 13 years old that's six foot tall and has a full beard, right? This puberty, he hit puberty about 10 years old, and I remember he would stand up and pitch. And our whole team was afraid of that guy because his pitches were so right. And you know, that, I don't know, 70 mile an hour fastball, you know, just. And um, you step up to the plate, and when they throw one of those fastballs at you, and it hit zings past you, you don't know what hit you. You don't know what went past you. Yep. That's the way I've seen that with sellers. They don't realize that they're no longer in the little leagues. They they're in the major league. Right, right. They don't want a business, and the opposing they're team, dealing with pros. They're, they're dealing with pros. And when yep. they step to that plate, and that pitcher throws that ninety mile an hour fastball past them. They don't even know what to think, it's right? Been now it's, it's yeah. Been now, yeah. And so, and so, I think it's really important to know what you're getting into, and to surround yourselves with professional advisors, people who have been in the in the major leagues, who operate in the in the major leagues, and know how to handle it, and know how to give you the coaching that you need. So, that, yeah, that's a great point, and that's that's really uh, it's so key. In fact, what I do. Or what I did, I don't do it much anymore. But uh, I would find out who the uh, clients' advisors are mm -hmm. and who they're currently using, and then I would go out and interview those advisors, and I'd come back and say, "Hey, you know, I uh, sat down and had a meeting with Rick. Uh, I think Rick's going to be very good." provide a lot of value in this whole in this whole process. Okay, say Rick is the uh, uh, financial advisor. Yeah. But again, you go out, interview the attorney. Say, uh, Fred, I had a great session with Rick, uh, your, your attorney, but I have some concerns. Oh, what are those? Yeah. That's what you're supposed to ask. Oh, and they, uh, that's my cue. Yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> So uh, Rick is a is a great guy. Been your uh, corporate attorney for twenty five years, so forth and so on. But Rick doesn't have any experience really in selling companies, and the people we're going to be dealing with are going to have attorneys who are real pros at buying companies. So we want to be on a pair of pursuit basis with them. Okay. But I have a concern about Rick. His, his firm is not active in the M and A business, and you see that all the time, where they'll engage you and learn the M and A business on your deal. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And uh, the firm has not done uh, hardly anything. Uh, Rick has not closed a deal in two, three, four years. 
firm, I think, had uh, one or two deals last year. So what I'd like you to do is, is I, I've got three people I want you to you know, chat with who are experienced, who I think are really going to uh, do a great job for you. And if you decide to, to go ahead and pick one of those, we, we, we always can keep Rick as your corporate attorney so that, in fact, to, to be honest with you, Rick will probably be feel better that you're bringing on a, a real pro. Bringing in that bitcher, right? That, that exactly, and that oh. hitter, that designated hitter, right? So, oh. and, and, and uh, Rick will feel better, and it'll be definitely a better job for you. Because we don't want to risk not having good attorneys on both sides of the deal. Great point. Yeah. Great yeah. point, Peter. Okay. So Peter's given us two or three things today that will kill your deal. We sure appreciate your time and appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. And, and remember, M&A, murders and accusations. Don't make your deal a murder and accusation. Don't kill the sale of your company. Do it right. Thank you. Thank you for attending our podcast. We invite you to join us for future episodes of M&A, Murders and Accusations, the good, the bad, and the ugly of selling your business. You can also visit us at www.bsalesgroup.com or email Rick directly at rick at bsalesgroup.com.